Hello, welcome to Manchester is Red, the United podcast brought to you by the Manchester Evening News. The Champions League called, they want some top European football back. On today's podcast, we'll take a look at United's fascinating draw with Barcelona as Thursday night football took centre stage this week. We'll discuss all the talking points for the match and also look ahead to United's clash with Leicester this weekend. I'm Rich Vey, and I'm delighted to be joined by a man who is much easier to lure from Barcelona than Frankie de Jong, Samuel Lucas. How are you doing? <laughs> Very well, thank you. Yeah, much, much swifter. Uh, I don't think Frankie de Jong was, was getting up at 3am to uh, explore what, what flights were leaving for, for Manchester at any point in the summer. But uh, yeah, back, back in place, back home very quickly after a, a pretty whistle-stop stay in Barcelona. And that, I suppose the biggest compliment you could pay the match on Thursday night was that it didn't feel like a Europa League tie, it did feel like a high-end Champions League knockout match really, which is testament to the two sides. Of course, Xavi said after the game that they're both in a good mo- moment and they probably will be competing for the top honours in the years ahead. Samuel, what did you make of the match really? It was a really fascinating one, I thought, and really nice to see United go toe-to-toe with a, a real top team. It was a marvellous, marvellous game, a uh, marvellous experience, very, very privileged to, to be present for it. The, the, at Camp Nou, the, the press boxes, as you might have seen from, from the pictures or the videos that I took, it's, it's a pretty um, vertiginous vantage point. It's, it's very high up. It's, it's not as high up as the away supporters and, and the view they have, but it, it still gives you a great, um, a great view of of how the game pans out and it was it was pretty fascinating just looking at some of the selections before the game in that Chappy made a couple of uh, had a couple of surprises the main one being that Marcus Alonso left back played at center back so that mirrored what Ten Hag uh, did with Luke Shaw which was signposted when he started there at Leeds but what Chappy did wasn't as innovative as what uh, Ten Hag did that the front four all probably played in positions that nobody expected them to play in and Ronald Araujo I think that's how you pronounce his name is, is a centre back by trade for Barcelona but he was switched to right back and that seemed to be um, an, an indication that Barcelona wanted him up against Rashford but of course Rashford played as the striker and he absolutely terrorised whichever Barcelona defender he came up against, particularly Kunde and, and, and Alonso, just wasn't really well equipped to, to play that role. I, I still don't quite understand why Xavi decided to go with Alonso. Um, but beyond that as well, although Veghorst is not occupying the role he was bought for, it was vindicated that his his role as the number 10, and sometimes he was a, a six, he was so deep, and it was quite early on in the game that he was defending inside his own penalty area. But what that did enable United to do was push Fred higher up. And when you've got Fred um, pressing, and obviously Fernandes is not going to stay on the right-hand side either, you've got probably the two most energetic and, and best pressers in the team, stifling Frankie de Jong and, and de Jong was extremely underwhelming uh, B- Barcelona's balance was somewhat upset by Pedri coming off towards the end of the first half and of course Gavi uh, yeah, he, 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 was, he had to resort to uh, cynically pulling Fred down and he got booked and he suspended for the second leg and it was just interesting not only did United actually play on the front foot and take the game to Barcelona and have probably four or five genuinely great chances at Camp Nou but it was what they reduced Barcelona to. Barcelona had to make cynical fouls from time to time, and their best chances came from uh, aerial deliveries, which is pretty much the antithesis of what Barcelona are known for. Uh, The first goal obviously comes from a corner, the second goal goes all the way in, and they almost uh, went 3-2 up from a set piece when when Casemiro somehow he hit the post I'm not too sure what he was trying to do but uh, he he was spared the embarrassment of an own goal by the post so overall it was probably a, a fair draw uh, a fair result but it, it spoke volumes of, of United's performance that Ten Hag was genuinely disappointed during his press conference that they hadn't won the game and again that's another progressive step of this this team that they, they're drawing these compliments from Xavi. They're having, you know, they're, they're forcing Barcelona ch- to change the way they play. I know the quality of, of La Liga has subsided in recent years. I think that was confirmed again last night in that Barcelona are 11 points clear at the top. And really, United were at the very least their equals. This is third place United. Um, they were their equals. But again, I, I still think that 
it was it was completely justified that they came away from that game feeling disappointed not to have won it. Uh, that said, they've got a terrific chance to qualify now. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's somewhat strange that that whole first leg is is kind of because there are no away goals anymore. It's it's almost pointless because obviously <laughs> we we start we start at nil nil again next week effectively. So we're all treated to ninety four minutes of football caviar really uh but it, it's not really counted for much uh in the long run no I, I mean like you said in terms of the actual tie it is starting again from scratch but i suppose united will have learned a lot about themselves and a lot about how they can play against the very best that, that was a real endorsement of what ten hogs doing again a confidence boost that they can beat the best sides because i suppose samuel the not a complaint per se but united's wins against the top sides this season Lots of them had been by embracing the counter-attack style of play. And it feels like as the season's gone on, Ten Hag has been learning little bits from every game against the top sides. And it all sort of accumulated in that Barca performance where it wasn't strictly them just playing on the counter-attack. Like I said, there's some real interesting tactical changes there. And United gave as good as they got, really. I mean, who stood up for you in terms of personnel then? Who were the, who were the players who caught your eye the most? And perhaps on the flip side, anyone that you thought had a bit of an off night? Well, I tweeted how great Casemiro was performing and then literally a minute later he <laughs> gave the ball away and it, it led to, to the equaliser, although the, the defending was still suspect there. I thought Varane, it, it was a strange performance for, from Varane because overall he was he was pretty pretty solid, pretty decent, but there were a few moments where uh, he made uncharacteristic errors or he could have done better. It's difficult not to instinctive, you know, instantly go to, to Rashford. Uh, Beating a man is too rare a sight in football these days. Certainly at high level football, there aren't as many take ons or dribbles. It feels like, and watching him just absolutely leave Rafinha in his wake, uh, he just screeched past him. It, it would have been a travesty had had United not got a goal from it. It was a pretty scruffy goal in the end, but it was again, it again showcased the the brilliance of Rashford at the moment. He's in career best form. He's in world class form. You you can't. You can't deny that. Fourteen goals in sixteen games. He scored against some some really good sides in that period as well. City, Arsenal, Barcelona. I think he's earned United something like twenty four points in the Premier League this season, which is a preposterous amount. They've got forty six points in the league, and his winning goals. Um, you know that they, they've contributed more than half their tally. So he's he's having a phenomenal season. Uh, no. No stage phases him at the moment. I think yesteryear he might have gone into a big game on a good run of form and then not necessarily shown shown up or shown what he's capable of. But he's 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 you know he's broken another ceiling. I think and when he is performing on stage like like Camp Nou, you have to just appreciate the the, the magnificence that he's uh, he's he's perform the magnificent level he's performing at at the moment. And beyond him, I thought Wan Bissaka was pretty. I mean, with Wan Bissaka, it's it's pretty remarkable that there. Are, I thought in in Barcelona he was he was better in attack than he was in defence, and although there are issues with his defending, and I think he let Jordi Alba in for an opportunity in the first mm. half, he still did get back and recover. But again, that's another player who Ten Hag has has improved. I, I did think Casemiro was good, apart from that one loose pass. Um, it's 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 worth you know giving him some some credit because he was so so bad for the first fifty minutes. But Fred, I thought the best thing that could have happened to him was losing uh, Marcos Alonso for, for for the first goal. I know there was an element of Malasia being culpable for that as well. And and, and De Gea doesn't still he still doesn't really command his area well enough at, at set pieces or for, at crosses. But after that, Fred was was really good. And as I said, Gavi. Uh, was you know tugging at his shirt desperately trying to to pull him down. So it, it it was strange in a way in that there weren't many really. You didn't come away from that game saying you know five or four six United players produced great performances. It wasn't like the Liverpool game maybe in in August where there were four or five truly uh, eight out of ten plus performances. But the performance last night was was better because this this team has evolved. It's it's not it's not just um, playing on emotion. It's not just a full throttle uh, twenty minute period and then. 
being quite reticent and, and pragmatic. Last night, United, as, as Ten Hag said, he, he felt they had seven really good chances and they, they should have scored at least four of them. So they're in a very good place in general and they're very well poised to get through next week now. I, I, I fancied them to score and it was always going to be interesting to see how Barcelona were going to play against a Premier League team because of course they did go out of the Champions League in a group that had Inter Milan and, and Bayern Munich so outside of La Liga there have been a couple of games already this season where they've been exposed and that was probably the case again against United even though United had quite a few key players missing. I mean I suppose Something like fans to be angry that you can t you can turn every positive into a negative. But Marcus Rashford's form is so incredible that every team in world football will want him right now. You know, there's still obviously discussions to be had about tying him down to to a new deal. I think United are showing enough that they're building something special here, and he can be the poster boy of this Ten Hag era. Mm. But do you think there is maybe not a threat? But do you think there is worry that you know Rashford's not playing too well because he can't play too well, but he really is making the case that every team will surely at least try and put an inquiry in and see if, if they could tempt him away from United. It's, it's a big ask, isn't it, for United to, to keep him happy and to match his ambition? It, it is. Uh, it's, it's also been quite a remarkable turnaround that this time last season he was, he was on the bench. Anthony Alanga was starting ahead of him. He didn't score again. Uh, from from this point on, from last season, his last goal came in January. It's it, the the job Ten Hag has done with him has been tremendous. I, I hesitate to say remarkable because there have the potential has always been there. He showed in the 2019-20 season when he really was the talisman of that team until he got injured in in January and that ruled him out for 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 a number of months and obviously it was even longer because of, of covid and the season having to be uh halted and then restarting in in june so that was a long time out for him but it's it's the variation of of his of his skill set now one of the criticisms of him and it was probably still the case in the last game at old trafford that he didn't score in against tottenham until he went on that fabulous run of scoring in, in successive home games was that his shooting was it was too identical. He he always favoured going for a power shot, hitting it on the laces. It's like I suppose if you're playing FIFA, it's just holding down on the circle button, isn't it? And and hoping it's going to burst the net. But with the goal against Barcelona, it's it's. I mean, Ter Stegen's culpable because he should not be that porous at his near post. But it's a cute finish from Rashford in that it's quite a tight angle. I think Alonso is is not far away from him if you look at the replay again. But he's clearly got a sense of the goalkeeper's positioning and he's aware that there is a little gap there. Yesteryear, he probably would have just had a hit and hope and hoped that it, it got past the keeper or the keeper might have punched it into into his own net. But there was acuteness about it and he's, he's finishing, his goal creations, it's... It's it's the complete skill set now. He's he's getting assists with his left foot. Uh, he's going on the outside. It's not always just playing on the inside. Um, I mean, I don't know what Rafinha was really thinking in that he seemed to think that Rashford was just going to go inside onto his left foot. I mean, he showed him the outside and Rashford just left him for dead. And you do that at your peril with him at the moment. He's his his form just speaks for itself. He's always had that big game prowess since his debut really. Um mm. I mean that that was a knockout tie. United were two one down from the first leg and uh they they were three one down on, on aggregate against Michelland, uh because they they conceded the first goal in, in, in the second leg. And then of course three days later on his Premier League debut he's he's scoring twice against Arsenal. So he's always been a a, a real you know a very, very good big game player and in terms of his contract, when he's playing the way he is and when he occupies the role that he's got in the team, United have to remunerate him fairly. Uh, it, it, it demands it. You can't just say, well, he's only played well for, for six months. You've got to look at the bigger picture, which is that unlike with, with other players, other higher earners in, in the past and in the present, they're not going to go on to bigger and better things necessarily elsewhere. Whereas with Rashford. That there, there, as you said, there's not a single club in the world that would not want him. You can imagine the, the Catalan sports dailies after last night. You know, probably was thinking about the prospects of, 
of Barcelona getting him on a free, uh, which would be a manner of heaven for them, given their financial uh, situation as well. Uh, Real Madrid, there has to come a point where, where Benzema is, is phased out. PSG, eventually Kylian Mbappe will, will leave and, and go to Spain or he'll go to the Premier League. And th there were probably a couple of Premier League clubs as well that would like to chance their arm with Rashford. Chelsea are not hesitating about throwing money around uh, at players who are not at his level. So it's United really do need to get him tied down a new contract before the summer because then they're in a very invidious position. And the longer these sagas, um, I don't like using that word, but it does apply. The longer they go on, uh, the, the the more worried you are for, for the club in that position that, that they're not going to be able to come to an agreement. And it really would be disastrous for United now because, as you say, he's he's the talisman of, of Ten Hag's team. Yeah, it might be time for Rio Ferdinand to bring back his infamous put the contract on the table, let <laughs> sign it, uh, whole spiel. So, uh, I mean, the wannabe technical looking... director, yes. <laughs> <laughs> looking ahead to next week, then, Samuel. United will be buoyed, they'll be confident Come, you know, coming into the second leg. Like you said, it's a bit of a clean slate, but at home they've proven that they can score goals against this Barcelona team. They've proven that they can beat them. They, they didn't, but you know, if they take another chance, then they, they could have put the game to, to bed or, or, or certainly be in a much more favourable position going into the second leg. United will have Martinez and Sabitza back from suspension. You could, they could have McTominay back. Anthony could be back from injury. Barcelona will be without Gavi, they'll be without Pedri, without Ousmane Dembele. Busquets will likely be rushed back from injury, but might not be at full yeah. fitness. United must be feeling confident. They must feel real confidence that they can go in and actually win this. How do you think they should approach that, that second leg? Do you think it should be a case of, of going gunko, going for the jugular, or do you think they'll be quite cautious, given that it is still level? I think an identical approach to Thursday night would would suffice in that they they did pick and choose when to to go on the attack after Lewandowski had that chance in the ninth minute when Luke Shaw got caught out a couple of times and that was the first one they did seem a little bit spooked by that and then for a good 20 minutes it felt like they were quite reticent they were just feeling their way into the game Barcelona weren't doing a great deal with the ball so United were quite content with with letting them have it and then of all people it was it was Wan Bissaka who ended that uh, period of reticence and went down the charge on the charge down the right and uh, you know created that opportunity for for Sancho which he, he made a bit of a mess of so they they've nothing to I don't really think they've got anything to fear with Barcelona the other thing with obviously sitting in the press box at Camp Nou is where you've got this vantage point it's, it's pretty much a tactical vantage point uh, you you could see immediately how high Barcelona's defensive line was and also how porous they were, where they did have a couple of players playing out of position. Koundé is a centre-back by trade, but it didn't look like it last night, and he's also spent most of this season playing at right-back. And within 20 seconds, United had sprung Bruno Fernandes down the right. And the thing about Fernandes, uh, where, he, where he's had these stints on the right this season, is that he's not been inhibited by it. He will always find a way of creating something, moving areas. And of course, he created the best chance of the first half last night for, for Veghorst by moving infield. And you watch that pass again, it's a really difficult pass to play, but he's he's got that in him. He is a, a world-class passer of the ball when he does get it right. And as you said, Barcelona will be without... I mean, their, their midfield is borderline decimated, really. I know Sergio Roberto came on and, and got the first goal from the corner, but he's no Pedri and he's no Gavi um, and he's no Frankie de Jong. And, and de Jong, there's going to be a big onus on him from Barcelona in the second leg because he's going to be without two of the, the main midfielders he plays with. Barcelona could still put out a pretty formidable midfield if you've got Busquets, de Jong and Kessie. It's, it's not bad. But their defence, it would be interesting to see what Xavi does next week, whether he does keep Arujo at right back or whether he moves him back to centre back. Because there's an, there was clearly an element of trying to guess what Ten Hag was going to do. And, and what Xavi did was, was kind of logical. We, we all predicted that Rashford would be on the left, Vekos would be up front, Fernandes mm. in the middle, Sancho on the right. And then come kick-off, it's like, oh God, 
they're actually all in different positions and that is immediately <laughs> going to cause confusion and as i said within 20 seconds united were in and uh the, the cross was just slightly too sharp for i think it was fred who was, who was yeah. trying to get onto it which again there's an element of tactical innovation there you'd expect rashford to be there or vekos be there but it was fred because he had that license uh to get forward and uh, be, be very aggressive with his with his pressing so i think although barcelona obviously that, that that pitch at Camp Nou has been massive for years and years and years. I think for the ninety nine Champions League final, they had to reduce it by a couple of meters on on, on either side, uh, just because just UEFA regulations or whatever it was. But United really seemed to make more of it than than Barcelona did uh, last night. As I said, Barcelona resorted to, to to aerial balls, which is just not what you associate with them whatsoever. And you certainly don't associate uh, Xavi with that kind of football as a player or as a coach. So at the risk of sounding overconfident on United's behalf, they they should really fancy themselves. They, they will be the favourites for that game next week now as well, you would imagine. And it would be an immense disappointment for them not to get through on the evidence of last night's performance. Yeah, I thought you were going to go full further on there and say Man United are back, but uh, <laughs> they will be back in action this weekend. Samuel, of course, you were in you know, the, the post-match press conference as well. Uh, two sort of main takeaways from that. We'll get onto the, the second one regarding the takeover, but Ten Hag was asked about the elephant in the room, really, which is the title race. I mean... Before the game against Barcelona, Man City had beaten Arsenal. It put United back within touching distance of the top two. Of course, Arsenal do have a game in hand, but United have beaten them both. Crucially, don't have to play either of them again this season either. So, you know, just as a matter of fact, all of United's remaining matches domestically are against teams below them in the table. They've made a good habit of winning those games. We both maybe are a bit hesitant to label United title contenders right now, but... It only takes two matches and they could be right right up there again. And Ten Hag, after the game, admitted, maybe more so than he ever has done, that they are certainly in the discussion, if not central to it. He Yeah, he said that essentially if they're in the position they're, they are now in April, then they can, can, they can be considered as, as challengers or there's, there's a chance there. Uh, for, for them to, to, to win the title. And I think that's a fair way of looking at it. It, it has been far too premature. Some people have conflated uh, pessimism with, with realism. It's, it's really not the case. When United beat City and there was a bit of chatter, um, not so much among the supporters. I think the supporters were just you know, revelling in, in, in a derby victory as, as they should do and would do. But from, from certain pundits and analysts, there was obviously that chatter about United being title challengers. They go to Palace, they concede in the last minute, they draw, they go to Arsenal, they concede in the 89th minute and end up losing that game. Um, they've, they dropped points against Leeds last week. I, th I think it still suits them to be in this position where they're competing mm -hmm. on all four fronts, but the attention is being hogged by City and Arsenal. And the midweek game was a case in point in that Obviously, Arsenal lost again. Uh, they've dropped, what is it, eight points now in the last three games. I, I mean, I, I really didn't think, and I still don't think, that their cup defeat to City is the cause of this upset in form at league level. The causes of that have been Sean Dyche, VAR, and City being a better team than them. Arsenal have lost a preposterous number of games to City in the Premier League in recent years. I'm struggling to think the last time they took a point off them. Um, City have just got this winning sequence mm. against them that they uh, extended in, in midweek. So Arsenal have got this in them. Anyone who remembers Arsenal 15 years ago, there is an element of history repeating itself in that they went out of the FA Cup quite, you know, in, in quite a, in quite a sanguine circumstances for them, and then their league form fell off a cliff and they collapsed. And that was a little bit later on in the season. I think that was an FA Cup fifth round tie that they lost to to United that time and Arsenal ahead of schedule uh, people forget that because they've been, had such a tremendous season so far in the league they didn't nobody saw them as title challengers at the start of the season it was all about well could they break into the top four and they're almost certain to end up there but because they've been in the top one or the top two for pretty much the entire campaign it's going to feel disappointing for them now if 
they do finish. Um, say, say they finish third. It was it was interesting what you were saying the other day about you know, chatting with Liam about what the odds are on on United to finish above Arsenal, because if someone did make a bet on that in January or after Arsenal beat United um, a few weeks ago, it, it might have been quite quite a shrewd bet to have placed because as I said Arsenal uh, Arsenal aren't in good rhythm at the moment and, and United are and it would be interesting to see if or when Arsenal do arrest this it's, it's more than just a mini slump because they, they dropped points against Newcastle as well I think they, you know, I can't quite remember what the exact record is but they've they've dropped a lot of points it, it feels like quite recently and by far and away their best performance was against United and United were their own worst enemy that day they they seemed to be caught between two stools a little bit and Ten Hag was very very critical of them after the game as he should have been so the way it's going along at the moment I think that that does suit United but you've also seen with City that they've dropped points as well I just don't think United have got the squad size or the squad quality mm. to capitalise on Arsenal or City dropping points. Arsenal are falling away partly because they've had a couple of key absences. It's not a coincidence. You look at um, uh, the, uh, Asu, isn't it? The, the right back yeah. is mistaken the week. He's, he's barely had a kick all season because Ben White's been playing at right back. They Arsenal do have a lack of strength and depth in their squad. And I think people always sense that that was going to be costly at some point. United probably have better depth, but they are still lacking in certain areas and it, it could still be quite pivotal in the Barcelona tie. They're not a very clinical team and I just don't think they can sustain this this habit of winning in, in a very gritty manner or, or, or by narrow margins for the rest of the season and somehow winning the league. I, I think that's just beyond them. That's too much of an ask. But the way it's going at the moment, you would say that they... They will probably need maybe only two truly top class players in the summer to be at a level where you look at the squad and you say, yeah, they they should be challenging for the title next season. Yeah, like you said as well, you can't maybe make it as negative because he's so good, but if Rashford does get an injury or he has an off week or he's suspended, then who is getting the goal? Where's that firepower come from, the balance of the team? immediately shifts and United's injuries as well already without Ericsson I know Sabitz has come in we've seen a bit off him but United have been depleted of a, a real creative player there in midfield and they still find it at times a bit difficult to break down the, the smaller sides shall we say and particularly that's been apparent since since Ericsson's injury we saw that against Palace so I think you're right Samuel I think they are probably still best of the rest the third best home form in the table yeah. Uh, third best away form in the table, but I think they're seventh highest goal scorers or sixth highest goal scorers, and they've conceded uh, sort of similarly. Um, they've got a worse uh, defensive record in the Premier League this season than West Ham United. They've conceded more goals than West Ham who were flirting with relegation. So, wow. you know, there's still quite a bit of work to be done. So, like you said, I think what is important is we take a step back to a degree and say, whatever happens now, if United finish in the top four, that is mission done. It would be very harsh on Ten Hag and this this set of players to be judged as having missed out on, on a title race just because they might drop off form in the, in the coming weeks. It, it kind of is irrelevant. Anything from now on is a bonus. Uh, the other thing that Ten Hag was asked about, Samuel, was the takeover latest. Of course, today is the soft deadline for those proposals to be finalised, to be... Uh, presented to the rain group and then from then on there should be more clarity about who is in the running who is serious about buying Manchester United uh, Ten Hag was told that you know he's been informed of the, the sort of general process but he's still very much focused on the footballing side of things is there any sort of takeover latest we're recording this at half one on the Friday is it still very much Jim Ratcliffe is the only person who's publicly stated his intention to, to try and buy the club while, whereas there was quite a lot of a uh, Qatari activity on social media on Thursday night? There was, and I think it's inevitable that there will be a, a bid that comes in from Qatar of some sort. It'll be interesting to see what the breakdown of that is, uh, what the... I mean, you, you can't have um, multi-ownership in Europe at the moment under, uh, under the current UEFA rules, and I think that should stay. Uh, the way as well. Uh, it'll be interesting to see whether UEFA double down on that or whether they relax it. Uh, Alexander Seferin, the 
UEFA president is very close with uh, the PSG chairman uh, Nasser, Nasser El Khalifi uh, since the collapse of the Super League because PSG had nothing to do with that. Al Khalifi, I think, has taken over Ed Woodward's role as um, president of, of the ECA, which I think is the European Clubs Association. Uh, so he's he's now quite closely aligned with the Seferin. And that that does worry me uh, in the sense that I don't think, just from a principal perspective, that United, if they became a state-owned club, I think that just sets a very dangerous precedent. People can say the precedent has already been set, but Manchester City were an extremely success-starved club when they were taken over um, in, in 2008. And when they did win the FA Cup in 2011, it was their first trophy in 35 years. Newcastle have not won a trophy since 1969, I believe. So that's even longer. And of course, they're, they're doing very well since um, the, the, the Saudi Arabia consortium completed their takeover in October 2021, I think it was. Uh, PSG, somewhat surprisingly, I suppose, given that they're a club based in Paris, which is this, you know, extremely um, you know, revered city and famous city in the world and you'd think there would always be a pretty big sporting institution there. There wasn't really. They, they did win the league a couple of times but you only have to look at their honours roll and they've been, I think they had two league wins and then all of a sudden there's this glut of league wins in the 2010s and if, if you're just having a cursory interest in football, you'd think, oh, what happened there? And you'd think, well, they must have been taken over by someone big, and that's exactly what, what happened. I don't think United should ever aspire to be Paris Saint-Germain. Why would you? Uh, any achievement Paris Saint-Germain um, accomplish is tainted. Every achievement Manchester City have um, accomplished since 2008 is tainted. Uh, Chelsea, their success, United fans have, have always chanted how Chelsea's success is hollow. If they're taken over by a state, then I suspect that chanting will have to stop because of the, the hypocrisy of it. Uh, I, I, I just, um, I, I think that if you, if, if a, an elite club like United are taken over by a state, it's, it just, it's the new normal. And the, the image of the FIFA president at the first game of the 2018 World Cup, watching it alongside Mohammed bin Salman and Vladimir Putin, uh, is, is just a sight that you should never see in football, but it's become normal. Um, you know, I mean, Seferin, I mean, he owes United fans one, really, uh, given the collapse of the Super League. No other set of supporters protested against the Super League as I ardently or as successfully as, as United's fans did. And look, I, I appreciate there will be a lot of people listening to this who are probably feeling insulted or are taking umbrage with, with what I'm saying because they think that the Qatari or Saudi Arabian ownership of Manchester United would be a good thing because it means you know huge transfer of funds, it means the team the chance of the team becoming more successful are even greater. But there is a moral there's a moral uh, obligation, I think, on, on behalf of, of of United fans, and a lot of them do feel this way, to, to, to rail against that, that possibility. Um, it's, it doesn't rest easily with me, and I'm not also saying that it should be, you know, an American that comes in, it, or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not talking about some kind of like Brexit policy of, you know, British owner for a British club. It should be someone who is, you know, quite clean who has has the backing who has the drive who has the clout and the reason why Sir Jim Ratcliffe has a lot of support among match going United supporters is isn't just because he's extremely wealthy it isn't just because he was born in Fowlsworth and was at Camp Nou in 1999 it's because he has experience of sporting ventures he has bankrolled uh, a number of you know things mm. in sport from sailing to football to marathon uh, running cycling as well uh, he's a pretty driven guy at the age of 70 and United fans have kind of reveled in, in City's success being tainted and the UEFA investigation and now the Premier League investigation about them allegedly cooking the books and 
once they're taken over, if they're taken over by a state, they they lose that more. They lose that more high ground. So it's it people like people want to get angry about this. Whatever side of the fence they're sitting on, understand that you can change some opinions. You can't change others. People have different cultures. They come from different backgrounds. Uh, you know that that's that's the beauty of, of of fan bases these days. It's it's a very um, it's a very inclusive set of supporters who, who follow football clubs, but from experience uh, of, of speaking to Manchester United fans, going to Old Trafford, I don't think the majority of them would be in favour of Qatari ownership. It's you know it's it's bad enough. It was bad enough for them that they were taken over by Americans in in two thousand and five. That three Glazer siblings needed a a police escort to escape Old Trafford. So. It's nothing to do with being insular or trying to anglicise the club or wanting an English speaking owner or anything like that. It's the principle of it. And there are certain elements of the cultures in certain territories that is deeply unpalatable. And you only have to look at Amnesty International to see the various issues and certain sets of supporters are more than willing to turn a blind eye because as far as they're concerned, they were they were success starved, and now they've they've got success in the case of City, and and in Newcastle's case, they've they've got a pretty good chance of success again. But with United, their drought of nearly six years is nothing compared with those clubs. So that's why the the the, the match going supporters, the, the the Greater Manchester supporters as well, would be more in favour of Ratcliffe coming in rather than. Um, someone from from a golf state, so it's it's an incredibly complex you know, discussion to have, and you, you're never going to say something that everybody is going to agree on, and you know, pe people just have to live with that. And if if they want to if they want to hear various people's views on the situation, they can do. If they if they don't want to, they don't have to. So um, yeah, it, it'll be interesting to see what what pans out, but. I think anything is is possible. Still, it still wouldn't surprise me if um, the Glazers just just have some investors come in. But the way it's going, it's looking more likely that there there will be a sale. So, you know, we'll have to we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, it's still very early days, like you said there, Samuel. I think that is maybe the the key point for lots of people to take. That you might see some accounts tweeting on social media and trying to cause a frenzy and get the the, the fan base on side, but until it's official you maybe can't be jumping the gun too much and yeah I'm, I'm a similar viewpoint of you Samuel that I, I United have always prided themselves on being different on being you know the trendsetters in English football you know being a, almost not elitist but above the others they do things the proper way and I'm not a fan of the if you can't beat them join them sort of mantra that well these teams have had similar investments so why can't United of course it's not down to the fans to decide that and they don't decide who their owners are it should be on the football authorities to veto these properly and do the, the safe and proper checks etc but yeah it's maybe more an indictment and reflection of modern the, the, football the, that these things happen this is the, the this is the issue with with geopolitics and, and normalizing uh this like for example Russia were awarded the World Cup for 2018 in, in 2010, uh, it was a decision that a lot of people decried. In 2014, they annexed Crimea. Um, four years after hosting the World Cup, they invade Ukraine and they butcher people. And you know, Gary Neville taking Qatari money and saying, well, I can educate them and leave a legacy and everything, blah, 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 blah. No, you, you probably won't. When when these things happen and countries, and let's face it, the, the World Cup going to Qatar was a scandal. It was the most corrupt awarding of a World Cup in human history. The proof is out there. Um, when you, you know, award countries uh, by going along with the sports washing, you just embolden them. I don't, I don't expect Qatari culture to change. That, that is their culture. Um, it's it's something that a lot of people disagree with for obvious reasons. Uh, homosexuality is is legal out there, so that makes people a lot of a lot of football fans are, are gay, um, and they they want to go to World Cups. They want to enjoy World Cups. If if they if if they discover that a World Cup is being held in a country where homosexuality is illegal, uh, that's 
that, that's deeply oppressive for them. And you just hear some of the horror, horror stories uh, about Saudi Arabia as well, how certain people just, just go missing. Uh, one lady has returned to the country and she was arrested and sentenced to 34 years in prison because while she was out of the country in the UK, she retweeted a tweet that was critical of Mohammed bin Salman's regime. Uh, I don't think football clubs should be associating themselves with, with, with people like that. And it was very, very disturbing last year that you had Amanda Staveley, who obviously was kind of like, you know, the driving force behind the, the takeover of Newcastle. She, she used the word sad to describe Roman Abramovich having to sell Chelsea. And I mean, when, when she uttered that comment, you dread to think how many people in Ukraine were killed that day by, by Russians. And it was, it was disclosed that his, his money had financed um, the, the purchasing of, of Russian tanks, I think, that were used to invade Ukraine. So uh, that's, that's the disturbing nature of it. You've got these people who talk about uh, geopolitics and see, you know, sympathise with people who just don't deserve it. Yeah, of course, and it also brings on to the sort of ugly topic of the what about tree and people trying to justify something just because yeah. there's other businesses who who take money from certain states or regimes, and it, yeah, it's not helpful in the overall discussion of it. And yeah, it's a real it's a real muddied one out there. And I suppose, like I said, the, the ultimate thing is we can't make your decision for you or your opinion. Research the subject, look at all, and whatever you think is what you think, and got to respect that uh, moving on then Samuel from the takeover to the football United back in action this weekend against Leicester at Old Trafford we mentioned you know that in the past when it's looked like United might be onto something there's sometimes been that backward step you mentioned the week of the Palace and, and Arsenal dropped points Leicester at home a game that you would typically back United to do well in but Leicester have have been quite impressive in the last few weeks they've got some big wins they've been scoring a lot of goals as well Casemiro suspended for the final game of, of his suspension domestically. Do you think that United are still in a good position to win this weekend or do you think there is an element of caution? Oh, I think that with with Leicester, it's, there's always got to be an element of caution because although they've had a very uh, mercurial season and at one point it looked like Rodgers was, was going to get sacked there, They've they've still got some really really good players and look, the, the, there was a lack of investment there in the summer that the tap was turned off you know, that that was probably inevitable after uh, what the owners experienced during the the COVID nineteen pandemic but Rogers is he's he's a very very good coach and they have had injury issues at key stages as well this season but I think when you've got Madison in your team you've you've, you've always got you know, someone who can create something out of nothing. I think Harvey Barnes is uh, a terrific player for them. They're, they're doing all this without Tielemans in the team as well. I think Tielemans didn't play in the Tottenham game and he, he might, I'm pretty sure he started against Villa, but as you said, they've scored they've scored eight goals in their last two games, uh, 4-2 win at Villa, and they absolutely took Tottenham to the cleaners last week. It was, it was like watching Leicester in their pomp under Rodgers. I mean, United were were battered by them last season, four two in in one of Solskjaer's last matches, and I mean Rogers has had quite a lot to contend with there this season because Vardy is obviously he's no longer a starter anymore. Um, Kasper Schmeichel was a really big loss as as the captain as the goalkeeper, and they they didn't bother to buy a replacement, which was quite odd despite the the, the lack of funds they had and um, players who were instrumentals them finishing fifth or winning the FA Cup, whether it was Soyuncu or Pereira, they're not as, as you know, front and centre in the team anymore, so they've had to have a bit of a changing of the guard there. But they've still got, you know, they've still retained their identity. They they play in the way that Rogers wants his teams to play. Uh, they've, they've still got good young players coming through. They're still making some, you know, really good um they're still recruiting very well i mean mendy hadn't scored until last week but it was an incredible hit pass fraser forster a tr tremendous goal so w when they're on song leicester are one of the best teams in the league to play and they will have had the benefit of of an eight-day gap um between beating tottenham and, and going to united and united in that time have, have played two games they played leeds on the sunday and of course they've 
just come back from Barcelona after playing a very intense game at, at Camp Nou. Two two intense games that were very tight. Uh, certainly going into the last last ten minutes at Ellen Road, it was it was still nil nil. So um, it'll be interesting to see how how driven United are because as as you said that there is a half chance that they could be in, in with a shout of challenging for the league if they're in you know, if they're still in a competitive position and they have also got this breathing space a little bit between themselves and Newcastle now and, and Tottenham losing last week as well so they've had a number of results go their way in recent match weeks and it's just whether they can sustain that momentum and They've they've got such a huge week next week with the Barcelona second leg and then the Carabao Cup final, that it would be it would be slightly alarming if they were to you know produce a pretty humdrum performance against Leicester on Sunday. That that winning run at home has ended. It was ended by Leeds last week, obviously with the draw. Um, so you know, it sounds just like reverse psychology, but that might it? actually. Yeah, it, it kind of you know. It, yeah, <laughs> so we we will twist it, um, but all, all joking aside, that might have slightly worked in their favour, and that people aren't talking about this this winning home run um, yeah. that that they've had going on since that they sorry they had going on since October. So uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of the game last season. It was I mean it was a pretty dire time for United. <laughs> the fan was arguing with Darren Fletcher in the stands and. Um, Leicester have had a pretty decent record over United in recent seasons. I think they're unbeaten. They must be unbeaten in their last last four in the Premier League. Might be the last five overall because they beat them in the, the FA Cup quarterfinals mm. a couple of years ago as well. So, uh, although Leicester have changed a lot, they've they've still got some some players who, as I said, were, were integral to to Rogers' team when they were when they're at in in their pomp under him. Leicester have changed a lot. Do you think United will make many changes on, on the weekend then? Because obviously, like you said, next week is so crucial. The decisive game against Barcelona, the Carabao Cup final as well. You mentioned Casemiro, he's still suspended. Injury news might be touch and go, depending on late fitness tests, etc. But do you think that there is a case to, to rest any of the key players from the start? Or is it just a case of momentum and, and play as strong a team as you can and try to win the game early? Well, Ten Hag was asked about this, and he said that um, of the you know, the constant um, the, the hectic schedule. He said the players like it. He said they obviously they like to play big games, and um, it, it's almost as if it's actually helped their rhythm. And he talked about how they're they're sleeping well, they're eating well, they're playing well. Uh, so I, I suppose if you've, if you're doing those three things, you're in a, a pretty decent place. But you would think that Martinez will come in because he's got to come in against. Barcelona next week. I don't think it would be necessary to go with the sure at centre back experiment. And although he acquits himself reasonably well, there were a couple of times where he he did look out of place. I mean, Lewandowski had a chance, Rafinha had a chance uh, through uh, sure switching off or not quite reading a pass uh, that was that was that was coming his way. Um, Sabitzer will probably come in with Fred. Fred Fred's got a hell of an engine on him. I mean, he he has been exposed. I think by being overplayed. We we've discussed this before. When he's used in a more rotational role, you appreciate him a lot more. When he's overplayed, uh, he's he's overexposed. Quite quite frankly, uh, and with the attack, although Veghorst is, I mean, it's one goal in nine, it's it's, it's not really a, a particularly flattering stat whatsoever, and he's not really had a, one good game, I would, I'd, I'd argue, for United either, but sometimes the, the ends do justify the means, and they probably did in Barcelona, even though on an individual level he didn't play well, and he really... I mean, he was stretching for his chance. The he I saw that Vegas didn't it. win any of his six aerial duels either against Barcelona, which you question. I saw that there was some reference on social media saying, oh, he's a bit like Fellaini, you know, he's sacrificing himself for the team, doing a real selfless job, and you've got to give him credit for some of that, you know, that work rate. But someone as tall as him, who is that physical threat to not win any mm. of his six aerial duels, that's quite alarming as well for me. It is, and I was I was told that the players at Burnley last season were quite taken aback. How I think the phrase that was that was used to me was that he, he just seemed to shrink when he when he was in the air, really. Uh, so it's it is strange that someone so imposing is not particularly 
handy with with you know aerial duels and whatnot. So uh, there has to come a point where he comes out of the team, but he United are compromised by Marshall's brittleness, and I think Veg has he's been available for nine games, and he's he's literally started all of them. So that would indicate he'll he'll probably continue, and he looks he looks a pretty fit guy as well. And next week he's got the chance of lining up against Barcelona at Old Trafford in, in the second leg of a knockout tie, and then lining up in a in, in a League Cup final for for Man United. So uh, he's he's got to come good goal scoring wise at some point. And he will almost inevitably score headers in both of those games now that we've jinxed it. So, I mean, I suppose it's not a jinx it. We've brought it up. So, yeah, if he does score a header now of those games, Indeed. I will take the assist on that. And like I said, we'll be back next week uh, to look back at the Leicester game and look ahead to the Barcelona second leg as well. So, Samuel, thank you very much for joining us today on the Manchester is Red podcast. Thank you very much, Rich. And thank you once again, wherever you are in the world, for joining us today. Uh, as always, we do ha- now have a YouTube channel as well, so search Manchester is Red over there. And if you're not already, leave a review, subscribe to the podcast, and join us again next week. As we said, there'll be a double header looking back at Leicester, looking ahead to Barcelona, and then one at the end of the week ahead of the Carabao Cup final as well. Take care, and we'll see you again next time. Anyway.